I don't know if any of you have ever been to the Principality of Wales, one of the four countries that makes up the United Kingdom. <laughs> and in the north of Wales is a national park called Snowdonia National Park, an area of fabulous, uh, rugged, mountainous beauty. And the highest peak in Snowdonia, amazingly, is called Mount Snowdon. <laughs> it's not particularly high, but it is very rugged. And I've climbed Mount Snowdon twice. The second time was about five years ago when two friends came visiting uh, for a holiday with me uh, they, from New Hampshire. And we went up to Snowdonia and we had a great week or so of, of hiking, the, the, the feature of which was hiking Mount Snowdon. And we just looked at a map and uh, I didn't really know much about it and we just thought, well, we'll start here, we'll go up this trail and then do a loop and come back down that trail. It was lovely weather, fortunately. What we didn't know was that this trail, well, it was called Kribgok and it was incredibly dangerous. Most of the trail consisted of this knife edge ridge, two or three feet wide at the most, with slippery rough rocks, with about a 500 foot virtually vertical drop either side. So the three of us and my dog <laughs> did this hike. And it, literally it was about this wide and this huge rock. People often fell off. That's not true. People would fall off only once. <laughs> But we did make it to the summit and then we came back our different route. It was a, believe me, a very memorable day. <laughs> the first time I was newly married and uh, we'd been married about two years and my mother-in-law came over from the States for a visit. We were living up near Manchester in the northwest at the time so we had a week of hiking and doing great things in the Lake District, gorgeous and then we were going to go to the North Wales. Now, my mother-in-law was really, really old. Um, she was like 50. <laughs> and she just had more energy than a barrel of monkeys. She was just... So every day, hiking in the Lake District, I was kind of struggling to keep up with her, but there was no way I was going to be outdone by her. But by the end of the week in the Lake District, I developed a cold. Actually, it was a serious case of man flu, but... <laughs> and then we went to North Wales, and we were going to hike Mount Snowdon. We went up a different trail called the Gladstone Trail, named after former Prime Minister uh, Gladstone. And it went on and on and on and on, and I was feeling pretty rough, really preferred, would have been happy to have been in bed, but, as I say, my mother-in-law was striding out in front and I was kind of trudging along behind. We finally made it to the summit. And you know when you're hiking a mountain, there are all these false horizons. You think, oh, there's the summit right there. And you get there, and oh, no, 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 it's another one up there. And you get there, no, 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 it's a bit more. And then often between where you are and the next, there's this huge dip. Yeah. You've got to go down again and up again. We finally made it to the summit and I was exhausted. And lo and behold, I didn't know this, coming up the other side of the mountain was a cog railway. <laughs> I had sweated and panted to get up to the summit and I could have just been sitting on my backside coming up a cog railway. But... I know that you know this, you know, no matter how you get to the summit, the view is the same, but your appreciation of the view is so much greater when you've worked to get there. When your, your legs are weary, you've really struggled, you've had setbacks and disappointments, but finally you've made the summit and your appreciation of the view is so much greater than if it, has been, if it had been easily acquired. 
Well, we're climbing a summit. And we thought we had reached pretty near the top. We thought we'd really achieved something. And now suddenly we realize that the summit is still a long way off. And not only that, there's this deep ravine now that we're about to enter. And it's incredibly discouraging. Just when you thought you were almost there, there's so much more work yet to do. Not only more work, but it's like we're back at base. And we've got all that climbing yet to do. But we do believe that there is a summit. And it is true that some people don't make it. Some people perish in the effort. Not everybody makes it to the top. But we also know that other people have climbed summits much, much higher. And they've done it barefoot and we have sturdy hiking boots. They've done it while storms have been raging all around and we have sunny weather. They've done it carrying heavy, heavy loads. And we have no such loads. But we know that there is a summit. And see, people have known it by different names. Thomas More called it Utopia. Some people call it the Kingdom of Heaven on Earth. Some people are more pragmatic and just say, how about a society where decency and civility and respect are personified by our political leaders. <laughs> but there is a summit, and there is work to do. And we're kind of discouraged because there's this deep, deep valley now that we have to endure to come back up the other side. But there is that other side, and we will keep on walking till we get there. You remember Joy, the one who lives in the neighborhood of happiness, but also the neighborhood of sorrow, the one who is not afraid to walk hand in hand with grief, who sees despair as a troubled but necessary friend, and who also travels in the circles of happiness and giddiness and silliness. Joy, though, always has feet planted on the ground of this life, in this world. And Joy has a very good friend named Hope. Now many use hope as a shield against the parts of life that they don't want to look at. And they escape the world through distracting pleasures and linger and loiter in the underworlds of numbness and then say, oh, well, you know, we were looking for hope. Mm -hmm. But hope is actually undone by this because hope is found in the small and meaningful acts of engagement and resistance. Now, I don't know about you, but if I think about these last months, I have not been spending as much time with my friends hope and joy as I normally would. Anyone out there with me on that? Now sometimes I meet them in the, in the back alleys of my mind and they whisper encouragement to me, which I take back into rooms more crowded with fear and anger and all those friends of Pandora's box. Sometimes they make uh, rabbit ears in the back of uh, serious conversations for me. <laughs> so that I can uh, kind of endure those. But they pass me notes with private jokes that let me not be undone by all that is happening. And on those days when sometimes it feels as if we just can't go on, joy and hope dance with wild abandon through the room, maybe in the form of a child or a puppy <laughs> or some other form of life. People think they're lightweights, joy and hope, but actually they are best friends with sorrow and resilience. They couldn't make it without the occasional party bash with joy 
and with hope who is, in fact, the quiet constant. In his 1986 acceptance speech for the Nobel Prize, Eli Wiesel, a Holocaust survivor, the author of the book Night, said this of the events about which he had written. The world did know and remained silent, and that is why I swore never to be silent whenever and wherever human beings endure suffering and humiliation. We must always take sides. Neutrality helps the oppressor and never the victim. Silence encourages the tormentor, never the tormented. Sometimes we must interfere when human lives are in danger, when human dignity is in jeopardy, wherever people are persecuted because of their race, religion, or political views, that place must, at that moment, become the center of the universe. We know that the times ahead of us are going to ask much of us. Just listening to the news these days is sort of an excruciating act of faith. How many people have turned off in the middle of a story sometime this week, right? <laughs> to hear that we have a maven of fast food settling the policies of labor for our nation, or a person of willful ignorance in charge of education, or a climate change denier in charge of our environmental policies, an executive from the company that caused one of the greatest environmental international environmental disasters as our face to the world? Please, I could go on and on. And the other is there too. The systemic injustice and the brokennesses which we know we haven't fixed. The loss of life, those 36 precious lives in the ghost ship fire last week, right here in our own neighborhood has resulted in even more housing displacement now. And that the reasons that allowed all those people to be living in that place are only going to get worse unless we say something, unless we are willing to not be silent. Hope, that thread, is going to be very important to bind us to the world to which we aspire. We are living in a world not of our making, a world that sometimes feels too difficult to comprehend. We don't actually know how to live in this world. And yet, as David said, there are many who do and who have already been living there all the time. And they know that what you do to keep going is to find that thread of hope and to hang on to it. Those who have were living in great dis duress before November 8th already know how to maintain that thread of hope in times of adversity, and it's time for us to learn from their teachings. At the intersection where joy and grief live is where the patient, true-spirited hope is found. Hope can be sometimes very quiet. Hope despises denial, who sometimes claims, as I said, that we should look away from what is too hard to see for hope's sake. Hope considers this a kind of identity theft, because hope is not about numb-down enjoyment or addictive distraction. That's actually what makes us wake up living in a reality show nation. Now, privilege means that some of us feel that we can choose despair and disengagement, and we can't. And we must listen to those who have never had that choice, and to hear that when they trudge with sor sorrow, they also dance with joy. We need to hone what they have, what all of us have, which is that, that ability to hold multiple truths, to walk along that razor edge of paradox, which is probably one of the best survival skills that those who have lived with oppression have learned. 
We have learned that what is tragic and unspeakable still can allow the silly and joyous to come forward. And people who must walk between these worlds understand what it's like to constantly be looking for multiple truths and multiple realities. Now, this is the world in which all of us live. We know now that life is sometimes terrifying, overwhelming, difficult, and incomprehensibly wrong. And we also know that it is astonishing, laughter-filled, charming, and enduring. Many, many, many of you are struggling with this holiday season. I want to remind us, as we have said many years in this space, that it was Charles Fallon and Harriet Martineau, two Unitarians fighting with their life energy for abolition at a time of particular hopelessness in that struggle that brought the Christmas tree from Germany to this country. They did it because they knew that people needed signs of hope in their life. And if it's harder this year to shop because of all the stores and products you need to boycott, <laughs> which sort of cuts out that spirit of the season, remember that the greatest gift you can give yourself or anyone else is the gift of hope, and maybe even a little sprinkling of that joy. Hope is not a flimsy, escapist excuse for not looking. It is the strong and constant companion to justice. And we make hope every day. So make some hope. Reach out to someone you think could use a little. Some people have given our nation, many in our nation, through that releasing of the opening of the Pandora's box, a license to hate. Well, today we grant one another a license to hope instead. Come and stay connected and do the small and sometimes silly things we need to do to court hope. Come this Thursday to the community dinner and stay afterwards to make signs because we plan to be in witness on Friday evening at the BART station, <clears throat> reminding people of the power of love over hate and that we want our communities to be welcoming of all. As this year closes and another opens, we will be asked again and again to resist despair and not be silent. And in the world in which we live, we need to all know where hope lives and who hope's neighbors truly are. Hope knows sorrow and is friends with joy. And hope will be our thread and our constant.